everyone and welcome back to the Squiggly Careers podcast. I'm Helen Tupper. I'm one of the co-hosts of the podcast. And on today's podcast, I'm joined by Anne Franca. Hi, Anne. Hi. Anne is the CEO of the Chartered Management Institute, which is an organisation that Sarah and I have followed and taken lots of benefit and wisdom from in our careers. So I'm delighted to be at the CMI today talking to you. And Anne is also an author of a book also published by Penguin, like ours. And the book is called The Create a Gender Balanced Workplace. I'm delighted that Anne is able to talk to us as part of our series of podcasts that we're doing for International Women's Day and really so that we can dig into gender balanced workplaces and what the problems are and hopefully what some of the things that might help us to overcome them are. So we're going to get right into that today. But first of all, I wanted to understand a little bit about In your own career, when were you first aware of some kind of disparity in terms of gender? When did that first start to become something that was visible to you? Well, it's interesting because actually my first experience of the importance of gender balance was a very positive one. And it was really something that happened by accident because of a tough time in my own life. I was going through a divorce. I actually was in a custody suit and I was in a full-time career at Procter & Gamble and I needed to take my daughter to school. She was two years old, and it was very important. It was simply non-negotiable. But I had a general manager who had a meeting that started every day at 9. And taking my daughter to school meant I could not make that meeting at 9. I would not get there until 9.30. And so I went to him, and I said what the situation was. And I said, look, I'm just going to have to be late. And he said, it's fine. Don't worry about it. The first few times, I walked into that meeting quite red-faced and embarrassed. But then everybody got used to it. So what I did with that is I paid it forward. I allowed my folks, who were both men and women, to work flexibly. So they had different reasons. They weren't going through a divorce. One of them played in an orchestra and liked to leave early to make practice. Another was a young woman who played netball, and she was on a team, and she wanted to do her sport. Another young man just liked to go clubbing, so he came in late and left late. Um, (laughs) But yeah, but we all worked around our lives, and I paid that forward. And it really paid back to me in dividends. We ended up having the best results on our brand. It was Oil of Ole. And I got this call from Cincinnati saying, we want to come and talk to you about what you're doing. (laughs) And what I was doing was two things. I had a gender-balanced team, and I was implementing flexible working for everybody. And that just created a results-based, authentic culture. I was talking to, it was HSBC, it was a couple of years ago, I was running a network called the New Work Network, and we were talking about how to accelerate the adoption of flexible working. And something that someone shared with me really stuck with me. They said that when people were asking for flexible working, one of the challenges was there was a sense of judgment about the quality of the request. So I'm a mother and I'm asking for flexible working. Okay, we understand that. I would like to go clubbing. (laughs) And that's part of, you know, I'm a DJ in my spare time that's less credible. And there was a sense of judgment that meant that people resisted asking for flexible working or they weren't as successful when they did, depending on how they positioned it. And HSBC introduced a policy, which I thought was really, really clever, about reason agnostic flexible working. And I I think it's... You have to destigmatize it, Mm. right? It's still very heavily stigmatized and we know this and it prevents it from being used in the manner in which it's intended by a lot of organizations. So people who take advantage of it do get, oh, well, you know, that's the mommy track. Mm. Well, no, it's not. Actually, research shows that most of us, 87% of us, want to work flexibly. It doesn't matter whether we're male or female, young or old. We all want to fit our work around our lives. And today, technology allows us to do that. And employers that get that and allow it to be truly agnostically Mm. implemented reap the rewards of a more loyal and more productive and better gender-balanced workplace. And so what made you write the book then? So there's that experience. I presume that wasn't the only experience. It was a very positive one. that was the positive one. So, okay, so why the book? Because obviously as CEO of CMI, I could write about lots of management topics. Um, But I chose gender balance because actually we're about creating better bosses and turning accidental managers into conscious leaders. One of the best ways you can do that is through gender balance. It creates better cultures, more engagement, makes people better line managers and delivers better business results. And the evidence for that is compelling. You know, just one statistic from McKinsey, if we had a gender balanced world, it's worth 12 trillion of GDP, which is, you know, huge, right? Even in the UK, it's worth 150 billion a year to have more equal participation 
in the economy. That's 5% of UK GDP. Mm. These numbers are staggering, right? And that's just one small bit of research. There are many other studies that demonstrate this. So for me, this is a business issue, a management issue, and it's something that's within our gift. I mentioned a positive experience I had, but I also have to be candid. The higher I got, the more lonely I got. Mm -hmm. And I had several roles where I was the first and only woman in the C-suite. And I felt very other. And, you know, there were times when I was belittled. There was times when I was bullied. You know, I had one leader, you know, shout at me at a presentation, who agrees with this woman? Yeah. So I experienced both the positives of gender balance when it happened and the otherness when I was the first and only woman and felt very uncomfortable. So that personal experience coupled with the body of evidence that says this is one of the best things you can do to build better teams, better line management, and better decisions was what made me write this book. And we have made progress, but we still have an awful lot to yeah, do. Yeah, so let's talk about that gap then. In an environment which is financially challenging, it's increasingly competitive, organizations are looking for ways that they can have competitive advantage. And then you talk about the numbers. Well, here's one. Mm -hmm. It's right here. Have yeah. a gender balance work. But people don't do that. They kind of go, well, let's right size or let's restructure. Why are people not seeing that as one of the most powerful solutions to competing and succeeding in today's market mm. and taking really accelerated action to make the change? So that's a, a simple question with a very complex answer. And there are many, many reasons. What I would say is that the companies that do do this do see the benefits and they become very strong advocates. But doing this is not easy. Ivan Menez is the chief executive of Diageo, has a very gender balanced workforce. He says it's all about combining ambition with action. Mm. Um, you know, Paul Pullman at Unilever famously early on championed this. They say it's hard, right? You have to be very dedicated. You have to make it a business issue. And you have to pull several levers simultaneously and stick with it. Setting a target, measuring your progress toward that target, making sure that your recruitment and promotion practices measure up, having sponsorship programs, not just mentorship mm. programs, but sponsorship for talented women. Those are many of the levers you need to pull. One of the best things that you can do is promote proportionately. So a lot of organizations get stuck because they think, oh, I've got a lot of women at the bottom. 50% or 60% of my graduates are women. So I've solved the problem. But the issue I is... I filled the pipe. Yeah. The issue is they haven't because what happens is that 60% at the bottom becomes... 40% in the middle, and 20% at the top. And by the time you get to the C-suite, it's 5%. I call that the glass pyramid. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the major sticking points, why we haven't addressed this problem. There are still far too few women in senior leadership positions, despite the fact that at the bottom, the bottom 25% of organizations, typically now, more women than men, or at least it's 50-50. So that remains a very stubborn issue to address. And for women that want to progress, and I know not everybody does, but for women who want to progress in sort of like a glass pyramid and they aspire to be, you know, senior directors, executive directors, you know, CEOs, is it that their needs are changing as they progress through that organisational hierarchy and that the support that the organisation needs to give them doesn't change with it? You know, things like flexible working becomes mm -hmm. more important at different stages. Sponsorship suddenly becomes more important. So mm -hmm. you can't generically treat everybody the same at all levels? Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. And the big other impediment that I didn't mention, which is responsible for a lot of this glass pyramid, is culture. Mm. Um, so a lot of organisations have cultures that unwittingly but convincingly still hold women back at work. You've mentioned a couple of examples of that. So as you get more senior, you may want to have a family, a very natural thing, but the culture of your company penalizes you in some way for that because they don't have destigmatized flexible working policies. Mm. They don't advocate that men as well as women take parental leave when you come back. If you are working flexibly, somehow you are regarded as less productive. Your way back into work is not as fluid and as 
appreciative of what your new needs are. As it could be, nobody sits you down and says, how would you like to come back to work? They just make assumptions. You know, oh, Helen won't want that big job. She's just had a baby. Well, mm. how do you know? Have you asked Helen, mm. right? You know, unless you sit down and have that discussion, you don't know. But those sorts of biases creep in. And another sort of bias that creeps in, and I hear this all the time, is that women that become more senior are regarded as um, abrasive. It's interesting. The word abrasive ne almost never, and there's research to back this up, gets used in male performance reviews. It's exclusively the domain <laughs> we of lucky? women. Um, you know, oh, that Anne, she's so abrasive. She needs to watch her tone. Mm. Whereas, you know, oh, Steve's assertive and knows his mind. Mm. So these sorts of biases, these cultural biases, become more prevalent in organizations especially in the upper half of organizations, because that's the way they've been for years, and that's what needs to change. Mm. And changing that, again, is hard. It takes a lot of work, and, you know, a lot of people don't want to put that much effort into it. Mm. It makes me think, actually, that I feel really lucky when I worked at Microsoft. Cindy Rose was the UK CEO, and Claire Barkley was the UK COO. Two of the most senior roles in that organisation, and both very strong women, I feel very lucky that I've worked in a place where they had the space to be impactful and the respect to do it in their way. We, you know, no one termed it abrasive. It was just two brilliant, strong performers in the organisation. Exactly, exactly. And set, having those kind of role models is really important because you could look at them and say, I can do that too, mm. right? Whereas for a lot of women, and I hear this a lot, you know, women that might be in their mid-career, very talented, they've been put on development programs with mentors, and they're saying to me, but my issue is I look at the top of my organisation and I don't see anybody that looks like me. And the behaviours I see there, the values I see there are not values that I share because I feel like I have to behave a certain way mm. and I have to go to work in a certain way and I don't want to do that. And so a lot of women look at that and opt out. And, you know, this isn't just about having families. The research shows that a lot of women look at those cultures at the top of organizations and say, you know what, that's just not me. It's not my values. And I'm going to do something different. Mm -hmm. And they go off and maybe they found their own businesses or, you know, they change their career direction. They may go into the third sector. And that still happens quite frequently. I've also been in an organization where I've thought that. And I've looked up and I thought, I don't want to have to behave in that kind of way mm -hmm. to achieve the success that I want to achieve exactly. in my career. You want to stay true to your values, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And I've run up against that. And, you know, it's not always ended well. I've had to leave roles because of it. Sometimes by my choice, sometimes because I've been told you need to leave, mm. right? So I think for women, it is that dilemma. And, and yet, and this goes back to, you know, one of the biggest things I think that's so important to combat this resistance and also the gender fatigue. This is a business issue that benefits everybody. So when you have that gender balance, it makes everybody better, men as well as women, no matter what. It helps with other forms of other marginalized groups, whether it's ethnicity or disability, because you're creating more inclusive cultures where everybody, men and women, feel able to bring more of themselves to work and make better decisions together, mm. which is what this is really about, right? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually, that's the outcome that we want. It's not for the sake of it, it's for better productive organizations where people can be the best and do the best work. Yeah, so and, they're, and they're happier and they're more loyal. And so for employers, right, or for people in the bottom half of their organizations, my advice is don't get complacent. Make sure that you are promoting proportionately. Make sure you're keeping the diversity you have in the lower areas of your organization up into those the top half of your organization because that's where organizations are losing out. Mm -hmm. That's that glass pyramid. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to correct. Okay. Promote proportionately. Promote proportionately. And can I just pick up on a term that you use that I saw in the book and I was, I was obviously researching some of the things that you've talked about, gender fatigue. I found yeah. that a really interesting term. Mm -hmm. Can you just describe a little bit what it is and why it matters? Yeah. Gender fatigue is what it, you know, what it sounds like. Oh, I'm really tired of talking about this. Oh, I'm fed up 
right? It's on the yeah. agenda we've, again. Yeah, you know, we've been there, done that, tick. Didn't we talk about this in the yeah. last board meeting? Yeah. Haven't we fixed it? We have 30% of women on boards. You know, I've ticked that box. Can we move on now and talk about something else? And unfortunately, I have heard many leaders, overwhelmingly male, so chairman, for example, or, you know, CEO saying, you know what, we've been there, we've done that. It's time for us to move on and talk about something else. But the reality of the numbers shows that despite excellent progress on boards, and I think that is a shout out, we've gone from 11 to 12% in 2011 to 33% now. That's the target for women on boards, and it's been hit a year early, so big bravo. Mm -hmm. But in the executive pipeline, you know, you've still only got 5% female CEOs in the FTSE 100. You've got less than 10% executive directors, right? That number has been stuck. So the women in leadership positions is stuck, mm. not just in the UK, but globally. And so that's where we need to accelerate that progress. And in an ironic sort of way, I think the fact that we've hit the board number allows a lot of people to say, I'm off that hook. Mm. I've been there, done that, got that T-shirt. But you haven't. You've just started. You have to fix your executive pipeline because all of these business benefits that I've been talking about, higher engagement, better financial results, the ease of recruiting and attracting better talent, happen when you have the executives balanced, not the board. Okay. That's what the data says. So that's why it's so important to keep on keeping on. So we've probably got, in my mind, I've almost got this picture of where you've got, okay, 33% at the very highest levels and maybe... On the board. On the board. And then maybe you've even got sort of 60% in some yeah. organisations for mm -hmm. your graduates. And then there's this huge middle area mm -hmm. uh, where something isn't going wrong. We're not promoting proportionally. We call cool. that the missing middle. Okay, let's talk about <laughs> how we don't miss the middle. What do right. we need to do? Well, okay, so this is where a lot of different levers come into play. But I think there are three things that I would advocate every organization to do, and then we can talk about what individuals can yeah. do. So if you're in the organization, and especially if you're in a big organization, know your numbers. So go to the government's website. This is if you're in the UK. They have to report. And one of the things, we advise the government on gender pay gap reporting, and we were very clear that everybody needed to do quartile reporting because we wanted companies to see their glass pyramids. Mm -hmm. So go in there and take a look at your company, and I bet you're going to see exactly what we've been talking about, that in the bottom half, you've got a lot more women than you do at the top. What does someone need to search to find that? So you have to go, just search government gender pay gap. Yeah. And it'll take you to the government website. And then you can put in your company name if you have more than 250 employees. Yeah. You can also search by sector, so financial services or IT or retail, and it will throw up the results. And that's a really important thing to do. So inform yourself. Yeah. That's what I'm really saying is that first step. Get to know what your own glass pyramid is and what your sector's glass pyramid is. So armed with that, then at an organizational level, you're really prepared. You can say, actually, we haven't cracked this issue because we may have 60% at the bottom, but we've only got 20% at the top. So how are we going to fix that? So that's when you start to do your process reviews. And the biggest things you can do are promote proportionately. Mm -hmm. So if you have 60% of women at the bottom, chances are the same proportion are going to be super talented as the men, right? So promote 60% and monitor it. Do you do that? And if you don't do that, why not? Mm -hmm. Are you even aware of your promotion ratios? We found at CMI that women, well, actually men, were 40% more likely to be promoted than women. So obviously, if you have men being more likely to be promoted, then your numbers, that 60% is going to drop to below 40% pretty quickly, and yeah. it does, right? So that's why being aware of your promotion rates is really important. And then that means that those cultural and behavioral things become more important. That's then the third area, which is Make sure that you don't stigmatize flexible working, mm -hmm. that you focus people on their outcomes, not their presenteeism, not their face time in the office, 
Make sure their objectives are set so you measure what they contribute rather than how long they sit at their desk. You know, that old trick in the city of people hanging a jacket over their chair so that everybody thinks they're there at all hours. Well, you know, that's Physically just present, silly. Physically present, mentally somewhere else. Exactly, <laughs> right? And that has no correlation to productivity. When people make those remarks that we talked about, you know, oh, Helen's had that baby, she won't want that big job, say something, especially if you're a man. Say, hang on a minute, have you asked Helen? How do you know that? Let's talk to her, mm, right? Mm. You know, or, oh, that Anne, she's so abrasive. You know, be bold. Say, would you have said that if we were talking about Steve? Um, so it's about making people aware. And those are the things, those cultural things, combined with the process changes and measurements that mean that we can get people up through that pipeline yeah. into the top half of the pyramid. And when you do that, that's when you really reap the benefits. And, you know, what is great is the Hampton Alexander Review, which is a government organization that has obviously pushed this agenda. When the chairs, even at board level, when they see that they have now the women on the board and they're more diverse, they universally say, wow, what a better atmosphere it is. And the same is true of the CEOs, you know, Ask any of the CEOs that are male or female who have achieved gender balance and they're like, you know, yep, we're getting much better results. It's a much better culture. It's easier to get other things done. Mm. And that's where these business benefits kick in. Mm -hmm. And that's really, you know, the biggest way of overcoming this, I believe, is keep emphasizing this isn't just better for women, it's better for everyone. Yeah. So you mentioned about individuals and we've talked about some of the big things that organizations can do. And then we got into, you know, if you see and you hear some of these things, call it out. And yeah. I guess that's one of the things that individuals can do. It takes quite a lot of confidence. I, so I have been in a situation where I didn't call it out. And I'll be honest, it was at Microsoft and I heard something. The comment was something along the lines of, um, oh, she's probably a bit ambitious. And mm -hmm. I, you know, that, yes. that comment. Yes. And I sat there and I thought, and I was relatively new in the team, relatively new in the organization. And I thought, oh, if I take on that, I've regretted it ever since that I didn't say it. But even now, I think, how could I have said it in a way that wasn't abrasive? <laughs> but maybe it doesn't matter that I would be abrasive. I can go round and round in my head, but ultimately I should have called well, it. Well, you know what? That's a great example, Helen, because ambitious is another word that's used in a derogatory way. It's like ambitious in quotes for mm. women. You know, there was a senior public sector woman, very capable. She told me the story about how when she looked across all the public sector of the people at her level, somebody had scrawled over her picture, you know, ambitious, <gasps> right? In the I same mean, I way, think that's a brilliant word. in the, like, yes, in the I am. <laughs> same way, right, as it was used in your meeting, like yeah. oh, that, you know. Now, men are ambitious, right? We just say, wow, he's going places. Mm. He's going to go far, right? And women want to go places too and want to go far. And that's a great example of a use of language that is gender biased. So mm. what should you do in that situation? Well, obviously the situation is different. If it's a very public situation, you may want to wait and take the person aside. And you could have said to the person who said that, I just wanted you to ask you, did you reflect on what you said there? Because it occurred to me, would you have said that if we were talking about a male colleague? Because some of this is just making people aware. Mm. You know, there was a woman, a middle manager, asked for a promotion. And her line manager looked at her and said, my God, you're so ambitious. And she held her nerve, looked back at the line manager and said, would you have said that to me if I had been a man? Mm -hmm. She got her promotion. Mm -hmm. So you can call these things out. It's about challenging the behavior, but you don't have to be obnoxious. Mm -hmm. You know, be specific. Don't be judgmental. Don't say, oh, you sexist dinosaur. <laughs> you know, just say, I'm wondering why you said that. I noticed the impact it had in the room. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that? What do you think the impact was? Ask people about what they think the impact of that action is. Yeah. And then if they shrug their shoulders, then say, well, let me share how it impacted me. That's really powerful. Really it it powerful. made me feel like, oh, it's bad to be ambitious if you're a woman, but okay if you're a man. Mm. I'm sure maybe that wasn't your intent, but that's how I felt. 
just conscious of our time and coming to the end of the discussion, I just wanted to summarise a couple of things that have really, really stuck with me. So creating gender diverse workplaces is not a women issue and it's no, not it's a, a, business it's, it's a business issue. Yeah. And, 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 so and an organisational issue. And one of the best ways that we can compete is to create gender diverse workplaces. In terms of the things that an organisation can do, it's about knowing your numbers. And I'll put a link to um, the government website that Anne mentioned so that you can do some of that searching if you've got over 250 people in your organisation. So know your numbers, have a look at that glass pyramid, what it looks like, promote proportionally and really focus on talking about people's outcomes and not ours. And then from an individual perspective, some of the things that we talked about were keeping an achievement log so that you're ready and prepared with kind of that, that factual things that you've done. Call out the behaviour when you see it and it doesn't feel appropriate. But, you know, it's not about being judgment. It's about sort of sharing how would that make you feel and asking questions. And I'd written down to sort of aim to be intrigued versus irritated. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to understand. Gee, mm. I'm curious. Why did you say that? What do you think the impact was? Mm, Let I'm me curious. share what it was on me. It's right? really, really powerful. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I really hope that everyone's listening. Well, in some ways, I hope it doesn't resonate too much, but I think it might do. And so I hope that if it does resonate with you, um, that you feel that you can take action from some of the things that Anne has shared. Her book has got so much more detail in it as well. So the book is Create a Gender Balanced Workplace, published by Penguin. Again, we'll put links to this everywhere that you can find it too. And do get in touch if this has struck a chord with you or there's anything that you think is going on that's really, really positive in your workplace that we can maybe shine a spotlight on. Please send us an email or just get in touch at amazingif.com or you can message us on Instagram where we're at amazing if and the last thing just to close out today's podcast so we ask a lot of our guests to share with us their best piece of career advice and could you please leave us with your parting piece of career advice for everyone sure and i'm doing this of course to flatter you but i also believe it's true careers are squiggly yay <laughs> <laughs> mine certainly has been and so i completely endorse that it's about keeping yourself open to opportunities, knowing your strengths, being true to your values. And I guarantee you, if you accept that, you will have a long, very squiggly and very rewarding career. Oh, thank you so much. That's exactly what we think as well. And I'm glad we're on the same squiggly page as that. Thank you very much for your time today. My great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.